always wanted to give others opportunities and make way for fresh young minds, as we've noted. It was his greatest hope that we would each end up doing the work we loved and loving the work we did. I graduated from medical school in 1982, and I'll never forget how proud Dad was of me. I think he might have bragged about me and all of us a fair amount. <laughs> uh, later, as a young psychiatrist, I joined the faculty at Harvard UCLA in 1989. When I first moved out of California for that job, I had the opportunity to go to um, in Santa Monica with Dad and Mom for a few months before I bought a place of my own. One time, uh, while we were living there, the phone rang, and a man said, is Dr. Bernstein there? I asked, which one? Turned out, it was one of Dad's graduate students, and he curtly said, your father. <laughs> Dad got a big kick out of that, and about the fact that there were two Dr. Bernsteins in the house. <laughs> um, as it happened, this was to be the last year of Dad's life. After a wonderful extended family reunion, Dad flew to Russia for a scientific conference in the summer of 1990. While there, he had a massive heart attack and died a few weeks later. Luckily, his brother Ken was able to travel to Russia to help him. Ken was fluent in Russian, having been an NBC News correspondent uh, in, Russia, uh, in Moscow during the Cold War. So Ken nav navigated the Russian system and was able to arrange for Dad to be flown to Finland, where uh, more health care resources were available. Thankfully, Mom was able to join Dad there during those last weeks. Dad used to always return from his trips with souvenir gifts for us. In his luggage, we found handcrafted painted wooden eggs from Russia that Dad had gotten for each of us, a reminder of his uh, ever-present thoughtfulness. I'd like to give you a glimpse into my favorite world of Dad's as I was growing up. Dad would bump, bump, and twick it. Now, Dad wasn't home. A lot of the time he wasn't home. He was on trips visiting Rafi. What can I say? <laughs> but when he was home, every night he was home, he would tell us a story from a seemingly endless river of marvelous creativity that flowed from his imagination. It would have been priceless to record these stories as we each remember them differently. Bump, bump, and twick it were two little rabbits. For me, and the way I tell these stories to my kids, they were a mama and her baby son who lived outside in the backyard under our cherry tree. Bump Bump was a very busy and responsible provider for her son and tried her best to protect him from the scary children in the house named Neil, Minna, Beth, and Julie. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, mischievous Twicket found no end of ways to get himself into endearing situations of trouble that poor Bump Bump thought she had to rescue him from. Yet to our delight, whichever of our kids was listening with rapt attention had the privilege of conspiring with Twicket to get him out of trouble before Bump Bump could find out that his identity had been compromised. Twicket always ended up safe and sound with Bump Bump suspicious, but none the wiser that another day's disaster had been magically averted. And that, as Dad said every night, is the end of our story of Bum Bump and Twicket and the nearly disastrous incident with Julie's bicycle or whatever the night story had been. <laughs> Tell us another one, we would immediately insist, and incredibly, half the time, he would launch into another one, continuing roughly where he had left off. <laughs> These are some of our stories that we share with you because you might never know this side of Dick Bernstein. You probably do, knew, do know his mischievous sense of humor, though. Once, when they were in, living in Los Angeles, which is the home of the vanity license plate, Dad speculated that if he were to get one of those personalized plates, he would use the letter MLBMS. Everyone would know what that stands for, don't you think, he said coyly? You know, molecular beans. <laughs> <laughs> We thank Rafi, Mike, and others for the meaningful stories that they had to bring to this picture of Dad from his experiences on the science side of Dad's life, where he spent so much of his time. We want you to know that we have found five hours of tapes that Dad recorded, filled with stories of his life, he had intended for a book from his own scientific and humorous perspective. These stories range 
from being stranded on the island of Bikini in the South Pacific a day before the atomic bomb was to be tested, to his meetings with great men such as Peter Debye and Pope Paul VI, to his thoughtful observations of both folly and greatness found in surprising places. We plan to transcribe and publish this material, along with many colorful and touching stories given to us by his colleagues and students at his memorial service. So look for more developments on this in the next year or two. To this day, um, I notice some of Dad's qualities passed on to me, to us, and now to our children. Curiosity, dedication, um, integrity, attention to detail, down-to-earth attitude, enthusiasm, a sense of adventure and fun, and love of family. When I see these traits in us, I realize the human legacy uh, that left, in addition to the scientific legacy. We recently asked Mom to describe Dad, and she may have said it best. She said he was a 100% kind and thoughtful human being, a darling. We thank you for our care, for your care and your interest in our father, and for launching this lectureship, lectureship in his name 19 years after his passing. Dad would have been deeply honored and pleased at this legacy of his work. We sincerely appreciate the honor of being included and asked to share our personal memories. We are happy to have this opportunity to be reunited with Rafi Levine and those of you who we knew from the past. We would like to thank Drs. K.B. Reddy, Mike Berry, and some other, and other donors who have made this lectureship possible today and into the future. As well, we'd like to thank Gil Nathanson, Loving Krim, Bill Certain, and the University of Wisconsin team that put this event together. We appreciate any of you who have traveled to be part of this and thank each of, each of you for attending today. scheduled a visit to Israel to work with Rafi Levine. Over the years, of course, I had visited him many, many times in Jerusalem, and he had, of course, come to the States, and we worked together for a long time. That's a whole story in itself. But I wanted to just recount this one incident. Originally, I had planned to spend a considerable amount of time with Rafi, but the schedule was so tight that I eventually had to plan for a very short visit so that we could just scope out some new research and I had to get back for a number of reasons, including the forthcoming Gordon Conference and so forth and so forth. So I finally scheduled the trip for a period of one week. And of course, for that short a trip, I didn't need a lot of luggage. In fact, I had planned this so efficiently that all I required was a small uh, so-called Avis bag, a very small canvas satchel with a few clothes in it. And then, of course, I had my briefcase full of technical papers and scientific articles and so forth. Uh, Rafi had already uh, arranged for my ticketing through El Al Airlines, the uh, Israel Airlines. So I went to the El Al counter at the uh, Los Angeles International Airport. When I uh, attempted to uh, present my ticket and uh, get cleared through security, the young uh, Israeli security agent started to interrogate me about what my intentions were. And uh, he was quite concerned about the... Uh, luggage problem since I had only this small handbag of luggage. I explained to him that I was going to uh, visit a friend of mine, a colleague, Professor Levine of the Hebrew University, and that we were going to do some research together during this period in Israel. He said, uh, what is the duration of your stay in Israel? What is your planned duration? He said, looking at this airline ticket, it, it appears as though you're going to be there for, uh, for one week. I said, yes, uh, it's a one-week trip this time. Normally, we spend more time, but this is one week. And he said, uh, now you mean to tell me 
He says that you are going to take a trip to Israel with this small handbag of luggage, and you are going to be there for less than seven days, and you're going to be doing research. That's not entirely believable, sir. I'm going to have to ask you to repeat this story to my supervisor. Uh, the supervisor also was a little bit incredulous. He said, what? Research in seven days? Hardly believable. In any case, I was able to convince these gentlemen that I should be allowed to get on the El Al plane after they searched both my luggage and my uh, briefcase for some kind of hidden weapons. But on the way over, I began to think a little bit about the, the truth in their skepticism. Research what? In seven days? And yet, as implausible as it sounds, some of the best research ideas can come in a flash. They can come in the middle of the night. They can come on an airplane. Now the execution can't be accomplished in seven days, but in terms of creativity in the field of pure science, seven days is infinity. Let me continue in the same vein. Sometimes on an airplane, when you're sitting cramped and hampered, you can't really do some serious reading or writing. You finished eating and drinking, and you've got a long, silent stretch ahead, and there's an absurd movie going on in which you have no interest whatsoever. Under these conditions, it's often possible to think and to think creatively. It is remarkable to me to recall how many of these airplane flights have given me the opportunity to do really creative thinking. I usually pull out a few index cards and start doodling, and my mind runs free as I look out the window and look at the clouds and hear the constant drone of the engines. And under those conditions, as I'm scribbling little notes to myself on the cards, ideas for new experiments often come to me. And by the time the flight is over, it's been possible to come up with a fairly well-defined research problem, which warrants serious consideration back home when I have available, of course, uh, my library of books and journals. But the really creative part is almost inevitably done away from the laboratory and away from the office, usually under conditions of isolation. Of course, we're all familiar with the stories of uh, the uh, discoveries made in dreams. Oftentimes, uh, during a period of insomnia, uh, rather than a period of dreams, I've had very interesting thoughts come to my mind about research projects, either ongoing or potential future uh, subjects of investigation. And in the quiet of the night, once again, in total isolation, hearing only the ticking of a clock nearby, it's possible to let the mind run free, and oftentimes something new and exciting comes, comes in, and, and uh, one is tempted to rush, get out of bed and get dressed, and run to the lab. Uh, one has to restrain a bit and, and usually just make some notes for the morning, but it is interesting how these creative ideas come, uh, blossom out without any apparent external stimulus, and usually under conditions of isolation from others.